Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. And we just ask you right now, we invite your Holy Spirit, Lord, to be our teacher, to show us the things that we need to see, Lord, to minister to our hearts uh, the comfort that only you can provide. And Lord, we just ask that you would give us wisdom and understanding concerning your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Oh, I forgot to mention, um, if you don't know me, I'm uh, TNG, the new guy. (laughs) My name's Eric, and uh, it's great to be with you guys this morning. Um, So, you know, God's word is full of promises for us. And so many of these promises we just hold on to. God has not just left us to, you know, grope around blindly in the dark and try and just guess our way through life. He's given us a guide. He's given us his word. And he's given us so many promises. And there's so many of these promises that just anchor us through tough times. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking about the verse like, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You know, that's one that we can just hold on to and know that no matter what we go through, you know, God's not going to let us go. And, uh, and then also Jesus told us, you know, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And behold, I go to prepare a place for you. We hold on to things like that. And then there's promises that God gives us where we go, oh, no, Lord, that's too much. You know, we, we don't need those promises. And it's things like all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Or the other time that Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. He promises that. And those are some of the ones where we go, no, no, that's okay, God. You can keep that promise. I'm, I'm okay with the other ones, the comforting ones. Um, but really, you know, the, the Bible promises trials in the life of believers. And it's, I've heard it said of the Christian that uh, you're either just coming out of a trial, you're just going into a trial, or you're in the middle of a trial right now. And uh, that can be said of so many of us. And as I look through my own life, I can remember times where I'm like, oh, man, all is peaceful. Nothing's going wrong. Thank you, Lord, for these five minutes. (laughs) And then trials come. So uh, anyway, in this, uh, Paul really gives us an understanding of these trials and, and how we're to get through them. And first of all, He says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Now, Paul had just been talking about the blessings of a spirit-filled life in the uh, beginning of Romans chapter 8. How God guides us and directs us and comforts us through the Spirit. How it begins with, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And uh, now he's going to show us that when we're empowered by the Spirit, we can understand the place of sufferings in our lives. And if anyone was qualified to talk about sufferings, it's Paul. And I, I know there's a lot of times where we can get comfort from somebody or somebody's trying to say, oh, I understand what you're going through. And, and a lot of times within our flesh, it's easy for us to say, oh, you have no idea what I'm going through. You don't know what I've been through, and you can't possibly understand. Uh, But Paul was one of those guys. He could understand. In 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 28, he says all these things he went through for the sake of the gospel. He was defending his apostleship before the Corinthian church. And so he, he laid this out as far as things that he had suffered for the sake of Christ and for the sake of them and their faith. He said, are they servants of Christ? I'm talking like a madman. I'm a better one with far more labors, many more imprisonments, far worse beatings, many times near death. Five times I received 40 lashes minus one from the Jews. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked. I've spent a night and a day in the open sea. Can you imagine that? Being shipwrecked and then treading water for a day and a half? 
That would be insane. And he says after that, on frequent journeys, I face dangers from rivers, from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the cities, in the wilderness, at sea, among false brother, brothers, toil and hardship, many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, often without food, cold and without clothing, not to mention other things. There is the daily pressure on me, my concern for all the churches. Now, one of the most amazing things that you can think about with the life of Paul is all of this suffering was 100% avoidable for him. Because when he was first called, God told Ananias, he said, I will show Paul how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. At that point, Paul could have just said, you know what? I'm not into that. That's too much. I like comfort. I like my lazy boy. I don't want to go do those things. Thank you, Lord. I'm out. But not only did this man suffer greatly, he suffered willingly. At any point, he could have just thrown in the towel. Maybe, you know, God showed him all these things he had to suffer for his name's sake. But, you know, it's kind of one of those things. I remember when uh, just recently when we moved up here, uh, I had told my family, look, you guys just need to move up and, and get yourself situated. I'm going to go back home, finish out work, and I'll pack up the house by myself. I didn't realize what I was getting into. <laughs> I had moved before, but it's like two weeks after you move, like the pain of it kind of goes away and you forget how bad it is. <laughs> so I'm halfway through, if I could have, I would have just said, okay, I'm done. I give up, I throw in the towel. But uh, Paul could have done that at any time, and he didn't. He willingly suffered for the sake of Christ and for the sake of people. Now, there's two types of suffering that Paul is talking about. The physical, which he just, you know, described for us in detail, but also the spiritual. He talks about the daily pressure on him, which is the, his concern for all the churches. And if you've never been intimately involved with leading and mentoring someone in the Lord, you'll never understand this joy or the pain of seeing somebody walk away. Um, you know, parents, I think every parent kind of knows this. Any parent who loves the Lord and is trying to raise their child and train them up in the way that they should go, uh, they know the pain when they see their children walking away from the Lord. Um, in one of Chuck Smith's teaching on 3 John 4, which says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in true, he stated that the converse of that statement is true, that I have no greater sorrow than to know that my children do not walk in truth, that there is such a pain that comes from that, and that's unique to the servant of God who lays down his life for others. And Paul knew this sorrow intimately. And uh, he goes from there and says, though, that despite all these sufferings, that they're not even worth comparing with the glory that's going to be revealed in us. You know, it's like asking a loving mother if the pain of childbirth was worth it, you know, to have their kid. You know, they don't have to think about it for a second. It's an immediate yes. Now, there are times during the teenage years where maybe they do have to think about it for a little while, and it really wasn't worth it. But uh, then, they, no, 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 it was, it was, okay. Uh, but we don't, we're not going to have to think for a moment in heaven, you know, was, that, was it really worth it? You know, with, with what I get here, was it, it's like not even a comparison. It's like, you know, was it worth it to make a straight trade for your 1987 Yugo for like a brand new Denali? Like, okay, yeah, no question. But I mean, the scale of that is kind of measurable. The scale of the deal that we get with the Lord is absolutely immeasurable. It's not even worth comparing. There is no comparison. Now, I know sometimes as we go through this life, it doesn't feel like that. You know, we don't understand heaven. 
you know, we've got just this, this very, very dim glimpse of what the Lord has prepare, prepared for us. Uh, you know, the, the Bible says that eye is not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things that the Lord has prepared for us. But it says, but the Lord reveals those things through our spirit, through his spirit. So we get little glimpses, but none of us truly understands the glory that's waiting for us and the joy that is waiting for us eternally. So this side of heaven, it's by faith and not by sight. We trust God that this is going to be true. And at the end of all these things, we're going to be rejoicing. And there is not going to be a single syllable of complaining in heaven. God is going to make sure that every single one of us is so filled with joy that we just cannot even stand it. And then in uh, Romans 8, 19, it continues and says, For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be re revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in the hope that creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. And this world, it wasn't built to last in its present state. God created it perfect and self-sustaining. And I mean, Adam hardly had to do any work. And it just, the, the ground produced crops that were just incredible. And then sin crept in. And before any of us throw Adam and Eve under the bus, we need to understand that they were the absolute best that mankind had to offer. They represented the absolute best that can be found in any of us. So none of us would have done it any better. In fact, you know, while Adam, who knows how long he lived before they actually fell, uh, it probably would have been two minutes. I wouldn't have needed Eve to do it. I just would have been, what, tree? <laughs> Okay, let's go. But Adam did that. And so the whole creation since then has been suffering with this bondage of decay. And it's not going to be like that forever. God's going to set it right. In Isaiah 11, 6 through 9, it describes the redemption of creation. It says, The wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf, the young lion, and the fatted calf will be together, and a child will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze, their young ones will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the cattle. An infant will play beside the cobra's pit, and a toddler will put his hand into a snake's den. They will not harm or destroy each other on my entire holy mountain, for the land will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord as the sea is filled with water." And right now, every wild creature has an instinctive fear of humans. Uh, I love to ride mountain bikes, and in Truckee, there's a lot of bears there, the, mostly black bears. Um, but uh, So I saw my fair share of bears when I was there, and I had two different mom and cub experiences. And uh, on one of those experiences, I was riding through a thick manzanita forest, and uh, they were pretty tall, and so I'm coming around this corner, and all of a sudden I come up upon a mom and her cub. And the cub ran right past me and up a tree that was right behind me. Mom runs up a hill about 30 yards and then realizes her cub's not with her, and so she turns around and faces me down, and I'm caught right square in the middle of them. And I'm going, oh, no. <laughs> and so I had fully stopped my bike, and uh, so I just step off and start to tiptoe backwards. But mom was facing me and kind of starting to lunge. And it looked like she was going to come after me. But I could just tell that there was a fear in her and in the cub. I mean, number one, they just ran away from me. Now, this bear was, I don't know, probably 600 pounds. The thing could have taken me out with one swipe. And yet there was a fear there. And that is only because of the sin that is present in the world, that the whole creation is subject to this bondage, to this decay, to this conflict. And it's not going to be like that forever. Every creature wants to be free from Adam's curse. And the earth itself even wants to be free from this curse. And it will be. 
it's funny how so often in the news, you know, they're, they're, they're talking about, you know, climate change and all these things and this, our world is going to be destroyed. And it's like, uh, yeah, it was never meant to last <laughs> in the beginning. God is going to have to redeem it before it is meant to last once more. Um, but I don't know about you guys. One of the things that I'm really looking forward into heaven, uh, you know, or, you know, maybe just millennial kingdom, but that's, I, I want to run up to a polar bear and just hug him <laughs> and hang out with them. Just give him a big old bear hug. I'm looking forward to that. But it says that even the earth itself groans and labors with birth pangs. So these contractions, these labor pains, they get more intense, more frequently as you wait for the delivery of the child. And it's plain to see that these natural disasters that are happening in our world, they're getting more intense and more frequent. And, uh, you know, as we went through the experience of having our first child, it was the, once the contractions, contractions started hitting and they started getting closer and closer, it's like, well, here we go. Seatbelts on. We're, we're doing this, like it or not. There's no getting out of it at this point. No backing up and saying, you know, let's just put it off a couple of days. It's no, we're going. And that's what's going on with our world. Jesus is returning. And the Lord is trying to wake us up and shake us up and saying, guys, I'm coming soon. For those of you guys who were around in 1989, uh, the Loma Prieta earthquake which is also known as the World Series earthquake that happened in the San Francisco Bay. Loma Prieta was actually down by Santa Cruz. And, um, and it was the most devastating earthquake that we had had in probably close to 100 years. And it was only a 6.8 on the Richter scale. Now, you think about just in your mind, how many earthquakes have happened since then? You know, I was kind of thinking about it, and I'm trying to, you know, at least the major ones that I can really think of. Okay, you know, we had the big one in Japan. Uh, we had the one that caused a tsunami in Thailand, Haiti, you know, and I'm, I'm coming up with some, and I'm thinking, you know, okay, so just to be generous, there's probably been 25 to 30 big ones since that happened. There has been over 700 earthquakes since 1989 that have been a 6.8 on the Richter scale or higher. And that's not even including the tornadoes, the tsunamis, all of these different things that have been happen happening all over the place. I mean, hurricanes that have just been ravaging our country as well as other countries. It has just been happening on an incredible scale. And so God is trying to shake us up and wake us up and for the church to say, Jesus is coming soon. And that's not to create fear in any of us. That's to create an eager expectation that our Lord is returning. And so we need to be ready. And then in uh, Romans 8, 23 to 25, he says, not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? Now if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. So just as there's two types of suffering, there's also two types of groaning, the physical groaning and the spiritual groaning. So probably most anyone over the age of 35 knows about the physical groaning, that uh, we get to the point where our bodies just hurt more. You know, there's times with me now where if I spend, you know, even like 10 minutes sitting down on the ground, I go to get up and I'm going, ah, oh, oh, man, my legs, my knees. You know what I've noticed? Um, I try to ride a skateboard as much as I can, but uh, one thing I've noticed is that they make concrete way harder today than they used to in the 80s and 90s. You know, when I fall, the concrete doesn't react to my body the way that it used to. Or maybe my body doesn't react with the concrete, some, something like that. Um, but you know, we, we all know what this is about. But the spiritual groaning, it's on another plane. 
Those who have tasted the first fruits of the Spirit, what they can do in a person's life, are only left longing for more. I remember the first time that, that I received the baptism of the Spirit, and I was just so overwhelmed with the presence of God, and I was just like, I could stay here forever, Lord. And that's not even a stretch. Like, it was such an intense experience of the love and the presence of God being poured out in my life that I just, there is no other place I would rather be, literally. God, let's stay here forever. And God's like, that's not how it works. That's just a little taste. Can you imagine going into an ice cream shop? You know, just imagine whatever your favorite ice cream shop is, going in and they give you like those tiny little taster spoons. And they're like, here you go. And you just do the little taste. And you're like, hmm, that was great. Okay, thank you guys. See ya. No, you're not going to do that. You get that little taste and you want to have a double or a triple scoop. You want to have all the ice creams. And that's really what, you know, this taste of the first fruits of the Spirit is to be within our lives. God gives us to us just to give us a little a little taste, a little glimpse of what glory will be like forever. And, and he's got a plan for us that, that none of us can even imagine. But it says, though, that we eagerly wait for this with perseverance. Everything that we sh do should be for the next life. You know, that I'm not saying that we just sit around and just pray and not do anything. No, we are to be active and engaged in this world. But everything that we do should be with consideration of how this is affecting eternity. And, uh, you know, that's where we're supposed to be putting all of our stock. The, the Bible says that our life, our entire life from birth to death is just like a short vapor. That it's here one moment and then it's gone. It's like going out on a cold day and you breathe out and you can see your breath and then it's just gone in a second or two. You know, and, and that's really what our entire life is like in the scope of eternity. That it's gone. We don't have a lot of time. And with the time that we have, we need to be wise in how we use it. Uh, I love taking trips with my family. Now I don't care where it is, you know, if we're just going camping up the road or uh, going to Disneyland with the kids or whatever it is. I just love time away with my family. And uh, when we were living in California, we didn't have family there. All of our family's up here, so it's wonderful to be back up here. Uh, but when we were living in California, uh, we didn't have a lot of opportunities just for Gina and I to get away because, you know, here it's easy. You just drop your kids off at the parents' house and off you go. Uh, but uh, so anyway, we took a trip to San Francisco, just Gina and myself. And, uh, and, and I kind of nerded out on the whole process because we didn't have a lot of trips like this. And so I wanted to make the most of it. We had a hotel that was like right on Pier 39. And I just so nerded out because I made an Excel spreadsheet that was like detailing every hour of what we were going to do when we were there and what restaurant we were going to this time and what, you know, sightseeing place we were going to do and all this stuff. And Gina saw it and she just started cracking up going, oh my goodness, you are such a nerd. <laughs> and, but the whole heart behind that was that I didn't want to come home at the end of the trip and go, oh, we should have done this. Man, all we did is sit around and watch TV the whole time. Like I wanted to take advantage of that time not knowing you know, when the next time we would have that would be like that. So I just really wanted to take full advantage of the time that we had. And uh, you know, really, that's how our lives here should be. None of us should get to heaven going, ah, oh, man, all I did was watch TV the whole time. I should have, oh, man, we could have been experiencing this, but I didn't plan for it. You know, the, every single one of us should be able to say at the end of our life, you know, I fought the good fight. I, I did my best and pushed forward. And it doesn't matter, maybe you failed every single day up until today, guess what? You've got from today to the end of your life. 
And Jesus doesn't base his scale based on what we've done before. He even told a parable, you know, about somebody who came to, his, to the Lord way, way late in life and has told the parable, parable about, you know, the guy that shows up at the end of the day for a half an hour's worth of work getting the same wage as the guy that had been working all day. That's our Lord. So if you've messed up every day to this point, don't worry about it because God is faithful to his word and he's going to reward us. We turn our hearts over to him today and it's a new start. And uh, so preparing and saving for the next life. After that, in Romans 8, 26, it says, in the same way, the Spirit also helps in our weakness because we don't know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with unspoken groanings. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. The Spirit helps in our weaknesses. I don't know about you guys, but I have weaknesses, and I need the Spirit's help in everything that I do. Um, you know, these unspoken groanings, you know, they may include the gift of tongues, but I believe more importantly what this is talking about is when we have no idea what to pray for. Maybe it's somebody else that's going through something really difficult. Maybe it's ourselves personally that's going through something really difficult, but these groanings that it talks about is when you can't even form the words to pray for what you need to pray for. And again, we serve a faithful God. So our God isn't going to be up in heaven say, well, you know what? My word says you don't have because you don't ask and you didn't ask, so you get nothing. That's not our God. God is right there with us in that pain. And when we don't even know what to pray for, he is right there beside us, reading our heart and saying, Father, this is what they need. And what's great is if the Spirit's praying for you, then he's always going to be praying for God's will for your life. It's not going to be some selfish, short-sighted prayer. It's going to be God's absolute best for you when he is praying for you. And... Uh, there was a pastor um, that at a, at a pastor's conference years ago was talking about a trial that he went through. And uh, the only words that he could form in prayer was just mercy, mercy. Because he was just so overwhelmed with the trial that he was going through on so many different levels. He was, he was just, his, his entire mind, body, and spirit was just ravaged. And that's all he could come up with was mercy and the Lord was merciful in that moment. The Lord interceded and brought him to the place where he needed to be. And then it says from there that all things work together for good to those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. Now, I don't know if this is one of the top 10 most quoted verses in the Bible, but if not, I bet it's close. I've seen it on posters. I've seen it on decorative pillows. They might even have a whole Romans 8.28 section of gifts at the Sower bookstore. I don't know, but it's one of those ones where you can look at, and on the surface, it's just so nice and comforting. You know, it's just, oh yes, all things work together for good. Now, that's, that's really easy to believe when you stub your toe, or maybe you hit all red lights on your way down to Coeur d'Alene on 95, uh, and you're like, well, it's okay. God works all things together for good. You know, but if you're in a car wreck and you're paralyzed, or maybe your spouse is diagnosed with MS, it becomes a lot more difficult to just utter that on the surface. It takes faith, and it takes the power of the Holy Spirit working that truth into your heart and into your life. Um, Britt Merrick, um, a pastor in uh, Carpinteria, California, with Reality Churches, his daughter, uh, Daisy Love, uh, she was the same age as my 15-year-old boy. In fact, I remember them playing together at the youth workers' conferences when they were like two years old, uh, just running around together. And, um, 
she came down with cancer at five years old and was uh, declared cancer free three times, uh, but then told that she has cancer four times. And she eventually passed away at eight and a half years old. Um, and I've, I've got just an excerpt from Britt's sermon, his first sermon after Daisy passed away. And he said, what if God gave us the answer to the question, why? Does that make the pain of life any better? Does why fix the broken heart? There are, I assume, I trust, good answers, but there are no satisfactory answers. The sin of this world, that's why there's pain. Uh, for God's glory, that's why we go through things. But couldn't he bring glory to himself in some other way than an eight-year-old girl who has cancer for the fourth time? And so the why question is not so easily answered because it isn't the right question. Jesus points us to the real answer to our current pain. He gives us something that saves us from the endless trouble of why. He says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. In that moment, he redirects the question to stop being why, and it now becomes who. Not why do bad things happen, but who is present with us when they happen. It's not about why, it's about who. He makes the issue one of God's presence. All is not well in the fallen world, but none of you will suffer without the Father's care. The presence of the Father is enough for the deepest places of pain. We don't see the end from the beginning. We have to trust that he is big enough and he is good enough to take all this misery and suffering and all of these horrible things that happen in life and to be able to work them together for good. And it really, again, is all about that presence of the Father being with us through whatever we're going through. And when we're able to do this, when we're able to fully come to that point that through the Holy Spirit, we can sit back and we can trust and praise God in the midst of a storm, and we can know that he is there with us in that storm, it's when we get to that point that we can say, as Paul did, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's funny because that verse so often is used for you know, they'll say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And what they're talking about is winning a football game or, you know, getting a new max on weightlifting or something like that. And no, that's not what Paul was talking about. When he said all things, he wasn't just talking about accomplishments or feats in the physical world. He was talking about all things, including suffering and trials and pain and being able to get through those with the strength of the Father. And then it goes from there and says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed in the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Now, I'm not going to get into predestination and election today that we would need 10 more studies to talk about that. But God has pre-planned a way for you to look more like Jesus every single day. 2 Corinthians 3.18 puts it this way, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Many times, God chooses to use suffering to mold us into the image of Jesus. And now some Christians are of the mind of, well, you know, I've struggled in this life. I've struggled with sin. And you know what? I'm always going to be sinful. So there's no sense in changing that or trying anymore. So I'm just going to enjoy the grace of God and, and just keep rolling with what I'm doing. And, uh, you know, now we shouldn't hide our sin and we shouldn't uh, be hypocritical and pretend like we're somebody that we're not or we're holier than we really are. We shouldn't do that. But at the same time, we shouldn't ever just give up and say, you know what, this is the way I am. I'm never going to change. 
God has never called us to be like that. You know, when I was growing up, my family, uh, we rescued a dog. Uh, it was before the term dog rescue even existed. We just went to the shelter and picked up a dog. Uh, but it was a, a basset hound. And this basset hound, you could see every single one of his ribs. He was completely bloated. Um, his body inside was just ravaged with worms. And, you know, since we were such a loving family, we just let him be. You know, we're like, oh, he's good enough. We'll just give him some what? No, we didn't do that. We took him to the vet and we got him the care and the attention that he needed because we did not want to leave him in his current state because that would mean death for him. Guys, that's how our Heavenly Father looks at us with sin that is inside us, ravaging our bodies, you know, taking so much and giving so little. That's what sin does. It aims to destroy us. And our Father loves us so much that he never gets to the point where he's like, yeah, good enough. I mean, I spent enough energy on that one. I'm going to move on to the next. No, God does not do that. He consistently, it doesn't matter how far you've traveled in your walk with the Lord, there's always further to go. There's always more to accomplish. You know, I love that Chuck Smith, even by, you know, the end of his life, he was in his, in his 80s and just going, you know what? God is teaching more and more about himself every single day. He was still learning, even though he had been regularly teaching the Bible for 60 years almost. And he was still going deeper. He was still learning more. He was still being refined. And that's every single one of us. God wants to continue the work that is going on in us. And then it says, whom he justified, these he also glorified. Notice that this is all written in past tense. That the work is already done. Now, maybe you don't look in the mirror and see a finished work, but God sees it. Because it's not through your strength and your faithfulness. It's through his strength and Christ's faithfulness. It's in the power of the blood, not in your self-will. And so he sees us as the finished work. In Philippians 1.6, we're told, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It's in his faithfulness we're counting to finish that work, not ours. If you're in a state where you just know, I'm a messed up piece of garbage, guess what? Me too. And we're all working our way toward glory. God's not finished with us yet. He's going to continue, and he sees us as that completed work. And if you're in the middle of something right now that you don't think you'll ever get out of, you know, a trial that just seems on the surface to be too much to bear, just know that, that God has a plan in this. God will work it out together for your good and for his glory. And I just encourage any one of you, if you guys need prayer at the end of the service, please reach out. You know, Pastor Corey or myself, any of the elders or just anybody sitting around you, I guarantee if you ask somebody for prayer, they're going to pray for you. Let's go ahead and pray together. Father, we thank you. And we thank you for the promises in your word. Lord, even with the promise of trials and tribulation, Lord, you give us that promise of comfort. Lord, that your Holy Spirit will be with us through all of these things. God, I just pray for anybody who is uh, just feeling down and out, downcast, and who can barely lift their head. Lord, strengthen them. Help them to be able to stand and to be able to praise you. Lord, be with all of us, comfort us, and strengthen us as we go from here. In Jesus' name, amen.